Presented by Caltech. So now I'd like to uh, move on to our last portion of the event this morning, which is our panel discussion. And so if our panelists and our moderator can go ahead and come down and get uh, ready. Um, our panel consists of three uh, investigators in our EFRC. Harry Atwater, who's the Howard Hughes Professor of Applied Physics and Material Science at Caltech. Uh, Jennifer Dion, who's the Assistant Professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Stanford. And Eli Ivanovich, the professor, professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at UC Berkeley. And will be moderated by the LMI uh, Director, Ralph Nozzo, who is the uh, Professor at uh, University of Illinois and also a visiting associate here at Caltech. So. We saw three uh, really stimulating talks in the uh, 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 so far, and um, and 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 we have uh, three more uh, very broad perspectives on the, on on the field that we're lucky enough to have with us today. So I'd like to a actually start uh, by a asking the first question, and I was wondering if you could, and bri briefly, if if you could. Um, uh, Tell us, like, from your view, like, what are both the, you know, the opportunities and needs for progress, right, in this area of, of, of full spectrum conversion and, and the realization for levels of performance that are really going to be transformational uh, in an important way. So, Harry? Okay, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just uh, lead off and say, um, I guess, you know, when I think about our, uh, our center and the science work going on in this area, um, really our job and our opportunity is to provide the science innovations that in turn will provide technology advances and technology options that actually drive forward the field of photovoltaics. And so there's kind of a science push and a technology pull going on simultaneously. And I think about different areas that uh, our center is emphasized and that emerging areas of science that are really, I think, ripe for opportunity. Uh, and I'll just mention a couple that I think are science innovation areas that I think are ripe for opportunity. One is the one that we've embraced very fully, which is full spectrum conversion, because that's the obvious place to go. Uh, we wrote a paper a couple of years ago that talked about the different opportunities for dramatically increasing efficiency, and that's one of the biggest ones. Um, and in that regard, I think I'll just highlight a couple of areas that I'm particularly interested in sort of watching and thinking about at the moment that uh, where we don't have a, a lot of things going on, but which are emerging rapidly. And I think uh, one is the notion of using what are called, uh, uh, by many people, metasurfaces, which is the notion of taking metamaterials and printing them in two dimensions and achieving many of the same functions that people uh, attempted or actually achieved with metamaterials in three dimensions, but they're a whole lot easier to achieve in two dimensions. And I think that's going to be technologically pretty important. And there are a lot of very interesting things that can be done controlling the polarization and uh, other states of light uh, and spectrum splitting is one of those. A second would be um, so from condensed matter science, thinking about ways that you could use uh, topological protection. I think this is something that there's not a clear idea of how we could use that in solar energy conversion, but it's an interesting <coughs> idea uh, to, to, to use uh, 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 topologically protected states where light doesn't, uh, is not able to scatter readily uh, and backscatter. A third area would be in, I, I think, if you think about materials, we're, all, we're, we're the light material interaction center, and we think about design motifs from uh, optical materials. But then, of course, there are the real atomic materials as well. And I think that's an area where there's incredible opportunity. And I would highlight one area as being the emerging 2D materials. Uh, 2D semiconductor materials like transition metal dichalcogenides. There's a whole middle of the periodic table of potential semiconductor and metallic materials that hasn't really been investigated yet. Uh, and on the technol uh, technology pulse side, I would say that right now what we're seeing in the, in the world is that more than 90% of the world is focused on crystalline silicon uh, manufacturing. We have to just sort of recognize that that's reality and that the the price of photovoltaics and the expansion of the market is uh, truly you know, staggering. And that's sort of the backdrop that a lot of the science is being done with. So what we're really thinking about here in this center is how do we go beyond that? And to do that, we have to make a substantial advance. It has to be not incremental, because crystal and silicon is going to incrementally advance uh, at, in, a, in a way that we can't really affect uh, in, a, in a major fashion. 
So in that regard, I think we have to aim for uh, combining uh, um, e either new materials, uh, new photonic design concepts that get us to efficiencies that are well beyond current efficiency. So that means over 30% efficiency uh, at a minimum, uh, uh, better than that if possible. Uh, another thing that is very important is the cost. And I think that it, w our, our job is to think about the science innovations and not worry about the cost too much at this point. But it, it ends up uh, intervening pretty quickly when you start thinking about technologies. And recently, we did some thinking about this. And uh, even a, a, we thought about, so what is the efficiency uh, cost premium you can enjoy as the efficiency of your solar collector or module goes up? And even as the efficiency goes to truly uh, you know, impressive heights of 40 or 50%, you can really afford no more than a factor of two increase in cost. So whatever we do, we have to think about in the end as being something that would be very cost effective. Uh, yes, a uh, very interesting uh, question uh, to uh, look ahead. Uh, I uh, just see the uh, field uh, growing in its importance and its impact on humanity. For example, uh, I, I like a historical viewpoint. You look back at the time when uh, we were hunters and gatherers, and then we switched to agriculture, and uh, that made a very big difference. But in the energy field, we're still hunters, hunters and gatherers. We go out and we drill and, and we search, and that's going to change. We're going to have uh, like an agrarian revolution in energy where we're uh, going to uh, put out uh, uh, solar panels and collect the energy and do things with it. But uh, we've got an obstacle. And uh, the obstacle is uh, that we don't have storage. And uh, right now, there's a market for the solar panels, but it's a somewhat limited market and has limited uh, human impact. Uh, and uh, for example, in Germany, where they're totally saturated, they have tremendous subsidies, totally saturated with solar panels, uh, such that on a really nice day in May, uh, they might be getting 50% of their energy, but that would be like on a Saturday at high noon at the end of May. Uh, they can get 50% of their energy from solar panels. It's fantastic, um, great accomplishment, at great expense, but still a great accomplishment. But the trouble is that uh, if you average over the 24-hour period, it's more like 20%. And if you average over the 12 months, uh, both May and November, uh, well, it dribbles down. It's like 7%. So you've made a 7% impact on uh, the electric energy in Germany. And uh, it's cost, uh, it cost them 100 million euros. So uh, the, the, the impact is not going to be there because you don't have the storage. You obviously, we have the capability of uh, gener generating a lot of energy in May, but uh, we, ne we uh, need it in November as well. And so energy storage uh, becomes very important. And energy storage means that uh, if, if you want to store it for six months, it has to be a fuel. And uh, so we have to go to uh, fuels created by uh, solar electricity. I think there are uh, great opportunities there, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, in making things other than hydrogen. So we know how to make hydrogen, but we're, we're, uh, we also know how to make methane, and we can make a tiny bit of ethane. <coughs> well, it turns out the ethane is way more valuable than the methane, and the methane is more valuable than the hydrogen. Uh, so we need uh, a lot of research in this area. And it's been a somewhat neglected area of science since the 19th century. And uh, I, I'm glad to see that uh, some new work is being done in that area. Jim. Great. <clears throat> uh, these are tough acts to follow. I certainly <laughs> second the uh, opinions of uh, both of the panelists who went first. Uh, maybe like Eli, I'll give a little bit of a historical perspective and go back even further to um, the 1800s when uh, Michael Faraday. Well, I, I went to the agrarian revolution. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's true. It's true. <laughs> Not quite as far. Um, but in the 1800s, Faraday was uh, playing in his lab with silver and sulfur, just mixed them together, um, and found the first material that had a negative temperature coefficient of um, resistance, silver sulfide. Um, basically, there was no material that existed at the point that had this sort of property, so he knew he had stumbled upon something completely different. He had no idea what the impact would be. The word semiconductor hadn't even uh, been invented yet. It wasn't until 1911 that the word semiconductor came up. So it was a completely new class of electronic materials. And I mean, now that forms the basis for pretty much everything we enjoy on a daily basis. Um, and I think now a similar revolution is unfolding for optical materials. Harry talked a lot about metamaterials, metasurfaces. They're really interesting. 
um, topologically protected optical materials. There are new kind of asymmetric and non-reciprocal materials that um, all could have very significant impact on solar. Um, and then there are also new uh, just materials combinations that we can't even come to predict right now what the optical properties might be, but um, they could have significant impact on um, full spectrum solar conversion. So I think a, a lot of opportunities are in kind of materials, uh, I guess, innovation and materials development and, and just exploration, not necessarily knowing where the impact will be, but being open to uh, new materials uh, designs. Uh, it sounds like, a, you know, the promising part here is that there's a broad landscape, you know, materials, optical design, form factors, and, 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 and scientific, you know, uh, uh, ba the basic principles of science underpinning it. So I'd like to invite the audience to ask uh, any questions that they, that, that they might have. I guess we covered everything in our room. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, you can, you wait for the mic. mic. Uh, what role do you think um, science can play in not only increasing the efficiency of solar panels, but also reducing their costs in, associated with installation and deployment? Okay, so uh, I, I highlighted cost as being crucial, that basically uh, you can indulge yourself, but only up to a factor of two over the cost of a silicon solar panel. Uh, and that's a pretty uh, tight constraint. Um, so, so I would say that uh, in the end, when you think about the scientific innovations, it's going to be simple ideas that will end up translating into uh, uh, things that are cost effective and, and, uh, and, and end up having a factor uh, in reducing the cost. It's kind of remarkable to think, actually, I've been really surprised to see that as the silicon if, if you look at uh, silicon photovoltaics, there's been sort of a Moore's law advance in photovoltaics. It hasn't gone as many decades in exponential reduction in cost per unit function as electronics has. It, electronics has uh, over 35 years has gone about seven or eight orders of magnitude in terms of, say, uh, dollars per flop or something like that. Uh, in reduction in cost. In photovoltaics, it's only been a factor of two, but a factor of two has been pretty remarkable. And, and it's kept going, even in this era, the gigascale, where we have gigawatts, you know, tens and- Wait a minute, Harry. Is it a yeah. factor of two per decade or a factor of two per what? Because it's certainly been more than a factor no, of two No, it's a, fa two, two two, a factor of 100. A factor of, ah, two uh, decades, So two exponent, you know, two, two uh, uh, yeah, 10 squared. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> so, but but that's uh, that, that and uh, so on, on the other hand, electronics has been gone at you know ten to the seventh or ten right. to the eighth. So, uh, but still you know pr pretty good for photovoltaics. But the thing that's quite amazing to me actually is that in the last four or five years, when in fact most of the world's silicon solar panels have been produced, uh, even the price of glass and polymers and things like that have gone down too. Things that you wouldn't expect to be very uh, uh, elastic in their demand uh, and their cost. And so uh, I think cost reductions are going to happen uh, as a, if, we, if we can make things that are compelling and get them out at very large scale. Yeah, the, uh, I, I think uh, you're bringing up a very good point uh, about cost. Uh, the truth is uh, the last person I would go to to ask what cost is a scientist. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and most of what they say about cost is they just haven't paid enough attention uh, to uh, be uh, knowledgeable. There are real cost engineers who know about stuff like this. But there's still some fundamental principles uh, that uh, we can depend upon. But before I tell you w what fundamental principles should guide us in cost, I should go back to what I was talking about, uh, the fact that Germany is saturated with solar panels and uh, eventually the, uh, probably other countries, there's enough factories out there in China and other places that uh, the world will be saturated in solar panels without introducing any new technology or even building any new factories. Uh, so if we look at the new function, like, uh, for example, producing uh, fuel, which I think is going to be uh, very important uh, in the future, uh, it's more demanding in terms of cost. Uh, to produce electricity, electricity is a very valuable uh, product. Uh, fuel is maybe a little bit uh, less valuable. And uh, so we have to reduce the cost of solar panels. If we want to be competitive in fuels, 
we need to reduce the cost of solar panels, another factor of three below today's cost. Now today's cost is already, as Harry said, it's 100 times lower than it was when I was your age. Okay, so I started in solar around, uh, you know, pretty early in my career, and the uh, solar panels were like uh, $30 a watt. And then correcting for the change in value of the dollar, it certainly come down by um, uh, 100, as, as we just heard. Well, all we need is just one more factor three, and we can compete in uh, fuels. Uh, but uh, sometimes people get the wrong idea about cost. They, they, some, people tell them various ideas, and they're just incorrect ideas. For example, uh, when I was starting out, everyone said, everyone knows that amorphous silicon, because it's amorphous, is cheaper than crystalline silicon, because, you know, it's a crystal. Okay? And, uh, well, I have some bad news about that. Crystal silicon is a stable phase. Amorphous silicon is a metastable phase. And because of that, it actually turned out amorphous silicon was more expensive than crystal silicon. So you can't always go by the superficial viewpoint about uh, what should cost more and what should cost less. So let me uh, suggest a way of thinking about this. Uh, and that is as follows. Uh, let's compare direct band gap material with indirect band gap. Uh, so they say, well, you know, uh, silicon, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's 10 times cheaper than gallium arsenide. Uh, so, uh, th so that would be the low cost thing. But wait, wait a minute, it's indirect gap, so we need to use 100 times more silicon than we would use of a direct gap material. And uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's 10 times cheaper, but you have to use 100 times as much. And so uh, that sort of, in my view at least, want low cost, go to the expensive material because you end up using much less. So things are very counterintuitive in the cost domain. And I brought with me uh, some films from um, Alta devices. These are the record-breaking solar cells. Alta no longer gives these away. They used to give them away, and they actually charge for these now, so you have to pay for them. But just to give you an idea, I, I have this little demonstration. Uh, how little material is there? There's so little substance in here that the stuff almost sort of floats. Okay, and uh, it's, <laughs> if it was a silicon wafer, it would go clunk down to the floor. It, it has very little substance, very little weight to it. That's the key to getting uh, the, the cost very, very low. And so you ha if you think about cost, you've got to be clever. You've got to think out of the box. So the obvious uh, ways of thinking about cost usually uh, mislead. And so be careful about that. Uh, I'm not saying a scientist cannot be an expert on cost, but then you have to dedicate yourself to truly understanding it. Um, so you mentioned before about um, doing the importance of storage, how like, you know, everybody's spending a lot of money trying to make these solar cells more and more efficient, but that the storage infrastructure in our country is still designed and geared towards coal and other massive things that run 24-7 and never stop. Um, now there's initiatives in California and around the country and in Europe to get more people to do individually on the grid, like to put solar cells in their home and plug into the grid and even sell power back. Do you see there need to be a similar initiative to help change the infrastructure, or is that is the only way the infrastructure is going to change is by a top-down redesigning of our entire power grid across California, across the country, across the world? So my opinion has nothing to do with power anymore. We've, we have a product, uh, and there are factories to produce a product for the electric utilities. And uh, we, uh, we're essentially, we've done what we need for that market. And, uh, but if you want to go beyond that now, uh, then the, you need storage. But it's not 24-7. It's uh, 7 times 52. You've got, you got to go for uh, uh, all year round. So you, you need to store for six months. And uh, that has nothing to do with the electric utilities. It's, it's just a new way of thinking about it. And it's very suggestive that uh, we need to be thinking about make, making fuels. But if we're going to make fuels, we need to bring the cost down by a factor of three even below today's cost. And then we need the high efficiency. How are you going to get the cost down? You've got to get the efficiency up because of uh, all the other cost factors that come into play. So, so I, let me just interject here and say um, there's, th this is a daunting task. Uh, Eli's right that the solar converter has to, you know, there's, uh, if we get uh, to, to grid parity, uh, people say, okay, fine, we've gotten to grid parity now. Solar can compete uh, on a cost competitive basis with uh, other forms of electricity generation, but that's not really a, 
a straightforward uh, and fair comparison because other forms of uh, solar or other forms of electricity generation are dispatchable. They can, you can uh, ramp up and ramp down or have constant output all the time, which you can't do for solar. You have solar is limited by the capacity factor. And if you look, say, across the United States, the mean capacity factor uh, is about 16%. Uh, that means uh, relative to the insulation, if, the, if it were 12 noon uh, on a sunny day, uh, 24 hours a day, the 24-hour uh, average uh, capacity factor of a solar converter is uh, about 16%. So that uh, is one of the biggest limitations. That also in turn feeds into the challenge of any device you use for storage or fuel generation because if solar is uh, PV resources on the earth rather than in space, which uh, you can also make an argument that space is a good place to put those because you have a much higher capacity factor. Yeah, it's to get them up there, though. Uh, well, <laughs> it is at the moment, but let, that's, that's only a technology problem that needs to be solved. Uh, in fact, we have uh, uh, here at Caltech uh, uh, a significant initiative to actually bring large-scale power to space. Uh, we can talk about that later. But the, the, to generate fuel, uh, then if it's driven by a terrestrial PV source, then it's limited by this capacity factor because then that, say, fuel generator is only being used 16% of the time. So it has to be, uh, we have to scale down the cost of that fuel generator because it's not running at 100% capacity factor unless we use some other source of electricity to generate that fuel. So it's a big challenge uh, on, on, on all these other things that impact storage as well. So we, ha we have a question from online. Someone would like to know uh, what all of you, the panelists, see as the most promising routes to getting to beyond 40 to 50% efficient solar cells beyond multi-junction traditional Let's cells. start with Jen. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, gosh, I wish they had stopped at the shockley Kweiser limit, but uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, I'll, I'll just give the simplest answer, which is an uh, approach my uh, group is taking, which is to look at uh, photon conversion. We heard a really great talk this morning um, from Shenhui Fan, who's trying to do full, spec or, uh, sp full spectrum conversion, utilizing more of the uh, kind of mid-infrared spectrum or uh, relying on device design that can precisely utilize uh, thermal emission and absorption. Uh, my group is pretty interested in uh, utilizing, I guess, more of the um, ultraviolet and then also the near-infrared part of the spectrum. So taking, uh, I guess, either a conventional single junction cell or even a multi-junction cell and then putting a layer behind it. This would be in the case of upconversion that can take the low energy photons transmitted through the cell, um, combine them together to a higher energy photon that then can be um, used by the cell above it. So an advantage over a multi-junction cell, um, or I mean, I guess it could be used even with a multi-junction cell, is that you don't need to have um, the up converter electrically connected to the cell above it. Um, nominally, it should be um, insulated from the cell. So you don't have to worry about, say, lattice matching, um, nor do you have to worry about uh, current matching. Uh, and our group has, has gone through the calculations and kind of determined where the um, ideal positions for the up converter absorption um, to be. Uh, they're pretty close to the uh, near infrared. Um, and if you take a single junction cell that has an optimal efficiency of 30%, an ideal up converter could boost you to 44%. If you have a multi junction cell with an ideal up converter behind it, you could get um, even closer to. Uh, Carnot limits, I guess. Um, the problem is most up converters and also down converters are quite inefficient, uh, not more than a few percent efficient, but um, we're playing around with uh, new tricks, not only to improve kind of the absorption of up converters, but um, to make the up converter kind of transitions more allowed and, and hopefully boost the efficiency of up converters closer to um, I mean, above 25%, which, which would actually get you a significant boost in PV efficiencies. Maybe not beyond 50%, but even an absolute 1% in cell efficiency would be, I think, a huge help to the industry. Eli, you look, you look uh, like Yes, uh, first of all, uh, what's the matter with 
it seems like uh, the, the questioner is being a little bit uh, greedy. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, uh, the 100% uh, is not the maximum efficiency because the free energy of sunlight is, uh, is less than the uh, total energy, right? Because you have entropy in sunlight. Uh, you have a big proportion of diffuse light, as we heard from Paul Alvis Autos this morning. Uh, so the, lim the theoretical limit is not 100%. The theoretical limit is, uh, f if you include the diffuse light, might be uh, closer to 70%. And then if you're at 50, you're not that far away. Uh, but I think I'm going to interpret the question a little bit differently, is what else can we do that has really high efficiency uh, that maybe is l a little less dependent upon uh, solar, but is using the same technology, and that is uh, to convert uh, heat into electricity. And uh, this is a project that's going on in, in uh, our center, and um, it's a new way of looking at uh, thermal photovoltaics so that we can convert heat into electricity with of the order, maybe slightly even above 50% efficiency. And it's using uh, a lot of the photovoltaic technology because you're, uh, if you have uh, a heat source, could, could be from combustion, uh, but it would produce uh, black body spectrum and some part of the black body spectrum would be useful to make electricity, uh, but most of it would be photons that are too small and the key there is to have uh, uh, photovoltaic cells with excellent uh, infrared reflectivity so they would recycle the infrared radiation and uh, get, it a, uh, get a chance to emit a black body again. So net-net, when we go through all that, uh, we end up with over 50% <coughs> conversion from heat into electricity. And that can also have a big effect. And the nice thing about it, we don't have to compete with all these factories in China. Uh, that are producing uh, panels at low cost. Uh, it would be uh, a new application, perhaps bigger than solar, because you could use it in uh, vehicles and cars and in many other applications. Uh, so that's an example of getting above 50% efficiency. Uh, early in the panel discussion, it was brought out that uh, a lot of new materials and systems, uh, even borrowing ideas from condensed matter physics, need to be explored. Uh, now, uh, when we put these in context with silicon, I mean, we have half a century of experience in making very high-grade uh, silicon in very large quantities uh, that can uh, give us very good efficiencies in uh, silicon solar cells. Uh, so uh, when we uh, put that logic onto these new materials, uh, do you think there is an impending material synthesis and uh, you know, uh, growing revolution uh, uh, that needs to happen to ha enable these materials to be grown over large enough areas with sufficiently high quality? And does that revolution sort of belong to the academic side on a scientist, or the does it need to be left more for the industrial people? Well, OK, I, I brought this up as, a, as an opportunity. Uh, I think both, really. I think that the, uh, in the science arena, we have to show that these new materials have the intrinsic potential for high efficiency. So for example, uh, the, the metric I would you know, apply in the case of, a, say, a direct band gap um, uh, semiconductor absorber would be the radiative efficiency, uh, the external radiative efficiency. So I would say if you have something that's as good as gallium arsenide as an external radiative efficiency uh, metric, uh, then you have something pretty interesting. Uh, and I don't uh, see it as being uh, intrinsically uh, 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 I don't see any intrinsic limitations to doing that for some of these uh, monolayer thickness uh, new semiconductor materials that are, that are being uh, investigated. Uh, there's a lot of progress that's occurred in the last year in this area, and I think we look forward to seeing more. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously, uh, industrial people have to get involved at some point, but I think there's still a lot of, I, I, I think of this as being a science area at the moment. I'm a little torn on this because um, uh, one of the things I've learned uh, at Alta Devices, I've learned uh, how hard it is to uh, scale up the growth of uh, gallium arsenide. But actually, they've uh, pretty much solved the problem now, and it looks like it can be scaled up. Uh, so uh, is that something we can do academically? I think in the academic world, we can look at new materials. Uh, but when it comes to engineering a very big growth machine, uh, I think we have to uh, leave it to industry, we have to leave it to government. I think uh, it can be transformative to have a machine like that and somebody's got to pay for it. 
uh, and, but the impact uh, will be uh, uh, gigantic. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, I agree with Harry, a little bit of both. And uh, yeah. I mean, I'll just add to that. I think uh, there are advantages to exploring new materials, and there are also advantages to kind of working with the existing infrastructure. Um, kind of uh, focusing a little bit more on the latter, if we wanted to stick with silicon, there are still ways of kind of uniquely patterning silica, silicon to get um, useful and interesting optical properties that can boost the performance of a silicon photovoltaic cell. Uh, the meta surfaces being one example. You can simply pattern, say, grooves in the top surface of your silicon cell um, to support uh, certain optical resonances or me resonances that allow you to uh, better utilize the solar spectrum. So there are ways of taking existing materials and then making geometric modifications to them at the microscale or at the nanoscale that allow you to better utilize uh, sunlight. So um, I, would, I would say it looks like we've arrived at the end of our time here. I'd like to thank the panel. I'd also like to thank uh, the three speakers uh, from earlier this morning who uh, presented absolutely uh, fantastic lectures and, uh, and I hope that uh, um, everyone goes back to their offices and laboratories inspired uh, to, to find a way forward against these uh, you know, really uh, wonderful opportunities but you know, you know, critically important areas of national need. So, so thank you all and, uh, and from uh, Pasadena I want to wish you all a very good day. <laughs>